Say you're walking in the mall, okay, trying to get some exercise, and you suddenly grab your chest and keeled over, and a group gathered around you. In this group, there were 10 people, and nine of them said, we're doctors, and we recommend that you get to the hospital right away because you're probably having a heart attack. The 10th person says, well, I'm a blogger. I think you should wait a couple of days and see if it passes. Whose advice would you follow? For years, climate scientists have been attacked. Their motives questioned, their evidence doubted, even denied. Usually the attacks were online, sometimes from Congress. But now they've reached a new height with the presidency of Donald Trump, where key positions in his administration have been filled with climate skeptics and facts seem to have lost their meaning. When people will treat evidence as optional, that's an existential threat to the idea of science, the very idea through which science arrives at reliable knowledge has been called into question. We now find our, ourselves, I think, in, in one of the most intimidating and, and, and threatening and frightening environments uh, that we've ever found ourselves when it comes to uh, the science of climate change. When you started your career in science, did you ever think that something like global temperature, global climate would be controversial? No, I didn't. And it still somewhat floors me that why is this controversial? This is a climate reference network. Before he retired about a year and a half ago, Thomas Peterson spent his career studying the climate, primarily for NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. The three white tubes, those are temperature sensors. That little cone there is pointing up towards the GOES satellite, the geostationary satellite that NOAA has in orbit. It's relaying the data up there. Data then get transmitted from GOES back down to Earth, sent to the National Centers for Environmental Information, which puts it up online right away. So when it comes to taking the pulse of the Earth and really getting a measure of how it's changing, you need something like this. We can see that in the bloom dates of plants that's blooming early. You can see that in Arctic sea ice decreasing. You see it all over the place, glaciers melting. You, you know that the climate is changing, even if we didn't have these sensors. But this allows us to measure it and understand the issues going on with it and, and how it's impacting other things. We came to talk to Dr. Peterson about a study he and his former colleagues at NOAA published in 2015, one that bizarrely landed them at the center of controversy. What can you tell me about the 2015 study? So, to explain this, it really is a step back first. For a few years, data seemed to indicate that land and sea temperatures weren't rising. But then NOAA scientists began to analyze new data, especially for ocean temperatures, as well as refining older measurements. So what happened was, we got these two pieces coming together, and then we combined them. The results were that the climate is still warming and has been warming during this time when people said there was a global warming pause. Their findings have been confirmed by other institutions since then. You can't argue with the science. The science is solid. So instead, you attack the messenger. As soon as it was released, the study was attacked, especially online. Dr. Peterson wasn't too surprised. He's gotten used to online critics over the years. One of the things the one blogger did a year or two ago was to take photographs, aerial photographs of houses of half dozen or more uh, climate scientists. What are people after when they're targeting you? I don't know what they're after. They're just against, you know? It's, it's kind of the view that, that we must be doing something bad because we're showing that the planet is warming and we're quantifying how the planet is warming, and they disagree with that. But the 2015 study was different. Congress decided to investigate issuing subpoenas for the study, alleging the scientists had manipulated data and rushed it to print for the UN Climate Change Conference in Paris. They were sure that this article was a trick or a fraud or, or, a, or, or part of a conspiracy. Rush Holt is the head of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. 
who published the study in their academic journal, Science Magazine. How do you respond to the allegations that this science was rushed to publication? It actually took longer to review and put through peer review and editorial process than usual. Um, and it was partly because uh, it was recognized that this was setting straight some earlier questions. Politicians for generations have been selective in the facts they want to talk about. What's different now is that ideological assertion seems to be crowding out evidence. Suddenly, as a scientist um, on the front lines of the science, you find yourself in a completely different world for which you were not trained, where you are vilified personally. For climate scientist Michael Mann, the attacks on the NOAA study seem to fit a familiar pattern. The 2015 NOAA study, there are subpoenas for emails. There is a so-called investigation. Does that sound familiar to you? Oh, uh, it, it does. I mean, these sorts of uh, witch hunts have been going on for some time. I was attacked uh, you know, more than a decade ago uh, for this iconic hockey stick curve that my co-authors and I published. Uh, it became this iconic graph um, in the climate change debate because it told a very uh, easily understandable uh, story that the, the warming that we've seen um, in, in recent decades is unprecedented in at least a thousand years. Why is it that you think specific scientists and specific studies are being attacked? The attacks against climate science and against climate scientists are intended to sow doubt in the public mindset about the, the threat of climate change. This study by NOAA scientists had taken away from climate change deniers this very valuable contrarian talking point that had been used to undermine uh, public uh, understanding of the science. Well, um, those were fighting words, <laughs> essentially. We've seen this all before. Uh, I think many of us fear that it's now risen to a new level. With today's executive action, I am taking historic steps to lift the restrictions on American energy, to reverse government intrusion, and to cancel job-killing regulations. So the question now seems to be, what happens when the skeptics aren't just online, but within the Trump administration? During their confirmation hearings, several of Trump's cabinet appointees were careful with their language, acknowledging the climate is changing but raising doubts on the cause and how serious the threat is. The increase in the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere are having an effect. Our ability to predict that effect is very limited. I don't know definitively. There's a lot of debate on both sides of the aisle. Well, actually, there's not a whole lot of debate. Today's hearing is... And this is Scott Pruitt. Before taking over as head of the Environmental Protection Agency, he'd sued the agency over a dozen times. I believe the ability to measure with precision the degree of human activity's impact on the climate is subject to more debate on whether uh, the climate is changing or whether human activity contributes to it. There is this disconnect at some level with where we find ourselves in, as far as the political environment is concerned, where we have to bring our uh, emissions down dramatically if we're going to avert uh, catastrophic climate change. And the fact that the problem seems to be getting worse before our eyes. We've now elected a, a climate change denying president who has staffed his administration with fossil fuel industry climate change deniers. So what does it mean when skepticism becomes official White House policy? There's a bill moving through Congress that might answer that question. So this here is the Honest Act. It's amazing. This is such a small piece of legislation that the House Science Committee is going to be discussing today. But it could have a really serious impact on the way the EPA works. The Honest Act is being introduced by Lamar Smith, Republican chairman of the House Science Committee. Before he became chairman, the committee issued one subpoena in its history. Since Smith became chairman, he's issued 25 and counting, including the subpoenas for the 2015 NOAA study. H.R. 1430 is a short four-page common-sense bill that simply requires the Environmental Protection Agency 
to base its regulations on science that is publicly available, not secret. The days of trust me science are over. For groups trying to protect science in policy, the Trump administration and new Congress have placed them on the defense every day. This last month, yeah. have you guys been pretty busy? Yeah, we've been wildly busy because it's something new every day coming out of the administration and Congress. Um, there's a pretty broad scale attack on regulations as a mode of public policy, and in particular on science-based regulations. Federal regulations should be based only upon data that is available for every American to see and can be subjected to independent review. That's the scientific method. We can On the face of it, the HONEST Act, which used to be called the Secret Science Reform Act, sounds good. The government does not it says that all the data used in studies the EPA bases any regulations on has to be made accessible to the public. If EPA's mandates are really based on sound science, then show Americans the data. But that poses some problems. You actually can't release public health studies because it's patient confidentiality. You can't release confidential business information or intellectual property. So there's a whole set of data that may not be released. The Secret Science Reform Act says that's okay. We don't want you, we don't require you to release it, but then the EPA can't regulate. They can't move forward. So it's a classic catch-22. You so, must use the information that you're not allowed to release. You can't release it, therefore you may not use it. They're attacking the process by which you create the regulations because you can't attack the premise of the regulations. Supporters of the legislation say that private data can be protected through redactions. But the HONEST Act is being introduced at the same time that Trump is proposing to cut the EPA's budget by one-third. So it's unclear if the agency would be able to comply. So what will this mean for the agency? On the one hand, there's very dramatic cuts to the research and science capacity of the agency that are being proposed. On the other hand, there are more burdens being imposed on the agency. So what's really the goal here? Is the goal to protect public health or is it really to stymie the regulatory process? Dr. Burke is also concerned that the bill says studies used for regulations have to be reproducible, something that's challenging for public health studies that take place over many years. Knowing what you know from the first study, is it even ethical to conduct another study? Most of what we know and the, the milestones that, that we've passed in improving air quality, because we did epidemiology studies that show, yep, air quality really impacts cardiovascular health really impacts mortality and really impacts respiratory health. Do we have to duplicate that before we take action? It's almost anti-public health. This all could seem a bit abstract, but for Mustafa Ali, what's at stake is clear. He worked at the EPA's Office of Environmental Justice for 24 years in both Democratic and Republican administrations, serving the country's most vulnerable communities. For years, uh, the communities that I work with uh, have always been struggling to be able to validate the impacts that were happening in those communities. The information uh, that the scientists bring to the process of really helping folks to have an understanding of the impacts uh, that uh, are happening and could happen is super critical. He left the agency shortly after Scott Pruitt took over. Talk me through your last, last few weeks at the EPA. Unfortunately, there seemed to be a lot of movement that was going in the backwards direction instead of the forward direction, uh, and one that was going to be more protective of the health of folks in our country, um, and actually moving in a direction where more folks would probably end up getting sick. It's not like we no longer have any public health threats. There are many public health threats out there that haven't been dealt with, particularly for you know, vulnerable communities. And the only way you can really identify threats is to put information together, including, but not limited to, scientific information. Regulatory decisions are about the public interest. And if you don't do that on a science and technical basis, then you're basically just doing it on a wholly political basis. 
Mr. Weber. Aye. Mr. Weber votes aye. Mr. Knight. Aye. Mr. Knight votes aye. Mr. Byer. No. Mr. Byer votes nay. Mr. Chairman, 17 members vote aye, 12 members vote nay. Okay, the ayes have it, and the bill is ordered reported favorably. The Honest Act was approved on March 9th by the Science Committee. A few weeks later, it was passed in the House. Well, if you weaken regulations, if you cut the budget, you're making a choice. And the choice that you're making is for there to be less protections for the American people. And you're also sending a message about how you value their communities, their lives, and their future. We made repeated requests for an interview with Chairman Smith, but his office declined. Budget cuts. So we tried to speak with him after the hearing. Between this legislation and the proposed budget cuts at the EPA, are you, are you concerned that the EPA will not be able to do its job? I'm waiting to see what the budget is. Well, it's, you could argue that it's not looking good. Are you concerned? They're, they're here to help protect Americans. If the Honest Act makes it through the Senate, it's almost certain it will be signed into law by President Trump. Science has become the target of folks who really perhaps don't like the regulatory policies. EPA science is perhaps the most transparent and the most rigorous done in this country. I know folks may not always like the answer, but if you look at it, when the answer agrees with the stakeholder, boy, they like that science. But if perhaps it has implications that might indicate a problem, either with their manufacturing or, or, or their line of work, then you see the attacks on science. So when science is attacked, when it's questioned and doubted, how does that filter down to the public? Hello, Hello Professor. Dr. Lewandowski is a cognitive scientist in the UK who researches the impact of misinformation on the public. We gave him a call to try to understand how people interpret skepticism and attacks on science. Well, who wants climate change? No one. I don't want climate change. I don't know a single climate scientist who wants that to be the case. It is such a big problem. And that means all of us, to some extent, are motivated to be swayed by contrary evidence. And then, you know, any attack against scientists will kind of play into that and people will say, oh, great, I don't have to worry about this. And uh, it gives you an escape. So when people attack science, how do you see that play out? Well, uh, interestingly, it's always done by the same rule book. We know that introducing doubt by disparaging scientists or by uh, pretending that there is a scientific debate, all that is very effective in uh, delaying policy action. It's only once the public is convinced that scientists agree that uh, then you get the momentum that is needed to, to pass regulations. Wherever you look in science denial, if you go below the surface and you just look a little more carefully, then you will almost invariably find elements of conspiratorial thought. So the scientists are conspiring to create this hoax and they're manipulating the data and they're making stuff up, etc., etc. So even when some of these accusations are false, does that still stick around in the memory of the public? Once people have formed a belief, or once people have encoded information into memory, it becomes extremely difficult to dislodge. Once information is out there, even if people might know that it is false, they continue to, to rely on it. Everything you've just said is 100% true. We've come to the Heartland Institute's annual conference on climate change. Here attendees are excited about what lies ahead with the Trump administration. Someone told me right after the election, a reporter said, well, you really got lucky with Trump, didn't you? I don't think we got lucky. I think a lot of people did a lot of work, many of you very selflessly for a long time. And now we have a chance to undo 
some of the damage that has been done. In a way, the ideas here could be seen as the new normal for U.S. environmental policy. That's Myron Ebel. He was the head of Trump's transition team for the EPA. President Trump committed during the campaign to reopen the endangerment finding. The environmental That's the EPA's rule stating that CO2 is a threat to human health and safety, obligating it to regulate greenhouse gases. The problem right now is that there is pushback from a lot of lawyers. Scott Pruitt is a lawyer. Lawyers are not here to tell you you can't do things. Lawyers are here to tell you how to do the things you want to do legally. I get particularly upset when I hear the term climate scientist. What is that? And this is Steve Malloy, another member of the Trump transition team. He's also known for his previous work for both the tobacco and coal industries. Hypothesis. There's no science going on in, in NOAA or NASA or EPA. There's no, there's no such thing as climate science because this is what it is to them, right? All they do is make predictions that go out to the year 2100, and we're supposed to you know, change our lifestyle, to reduce our standard of living, completely change our political system for this. It's crazy. I think government needs to get out of science. I think government has perverted science. Yeah. And I appreciate that. This is a problem of secret data. Now, this has been mostly a problem at EPA. And there's Lamar Smith, the House Science Chairman, celebrating the Honest Act. What the bill basically uh, says is that none of these regulations can go into effect unless the data has been made publicly available. That is a huge disincentive to pass regulations at all, much less uh, bad regulations. You, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Will Happer. That's William Happer, a physics professor at Princeton and formerly with the George C. Marshall Institute, a free market think tank known for its ties to the fossil fuel industry. He now leads the CO2 coalition, which believes that more CO2 is actually better for the planet, which is directly the opposite of the scientific consensus. The levels that carbon is right now, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. um, does that concern you when you look back historically at the yeah, same yeah, levels? Yeah, it's too low. It's too low. It should be three or four times what it is now. Have you ever wondered, what if you're wrong on this? Yeah. Of course. And you're willing to take that risk when almost every climate scientist agrees that the level of CO2 we're emitting right now could be disastrous. They're simply wrong. Climate is driven by political imperatives. They're trying to drive climate science with political imperatives. It, it means... Who is they? They is governments who want lots of control. You know, if you can control energy, you know, that's hard to beat in terms of a uh, sort of master control knob. Climate will continue to change whether CO2 levels increase or not. Donald Trump met with Dr. Happer in January to consider him as the potential White House science advisor. There's a poor Shanghai resident there with a mask on, but none of this is CO2. At the time this report went to air, Trump had begun the rollback of Obama's clean power plant rules. So what's the next step? I think it is absolutely critical to the future policy that we reopen and undo the endangerment finding. Because if we don't, it's going to be very hard to just say we're done with all of these climate rules. Maybe once it would have seemed unlikely that the rule could ever be undone, but we're living in a different time now. One in which scientists say the evidence is going one way, but the country is headed in another. Trump made promises. The purpose of the transition was to implement the promise, figure out how to implement them. So here's what they are. Withdraw from Paris, defund the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. I feel these people are just trying to stay whole, you know, let's stop progress. Reopen the endangerment finding, withdraw the climate rules, the power plant rules. This is the moment in time that we're at where folks will one day look back and say, this is the reason that we are where we are. You add all these up, and this changes the entire direction of the country. So we did get lucky, I hope.